messages that tell us how important we are. That we're the most important person on the face of the earth. Buy this, you're worth it. Treat yourself, you deserve it. Indulge yourself. Nescafe's slogan is, it's all about you. In the film Armadeus, I don't know if you've seen it, but it tells the story of the com composer Antonio Salaleri, who is the core composer to Emperor Joseph in the second. It's a story of his life living in the shadow of the great composer Mozart. His life is consumed by bitterness and jealousy, but he fights on. And there's one telling scene where he's in, where as a young man, he's in the chapel. He looks at the crucifix and he prays this prayer. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Make me famous through the world. Dear God, make me immortal. And I wonder how often we pray similar things. And actually there are elements of that prayer which are wonderful. Lord, make me a great composer. We need to pray that the Lord will make us the best that we can be with the gifts that he's given us. Make me a great scientist, make me a great doctor, a great teacher, a great parent, a great grandparent. Let me celebrate your glory through music. Again, that is such a healthy prayer. Let me celebrate God's glory with whatever we put our hands to. But so often we tag that second half of the prayer. Make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. Because if we're honest, some of us, many of us, hunger for affections, for praise of others. And in our society, if we fail to live lives of humility and rather live lives based around ourselves, then the whole world will suffer. It was the author, Andrew Murray, who wrote, Humility is the root of every virtue. So pride or the loss of humility is the root of every sin and evil. So what is the antidote to this kind of me-faced, inward-looking society? Well, it's humility. Yeah. Humility is a principle that's found throughout the whole of the scriptures. We see in Psalm 145, verse 6, the Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked to the ground. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11 the haunty looks of man shall be brought low, but the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And then, of course, there's Philippians 2, talking of Jesus and being found in human form. He humbled himself becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God is clearly trying to impose and impress on us the importance of humility, the importance of bowing down, of reverence. And I wonder how, much of, how many of us have actually misunderstood what humility is. For so long I kind of thought humility meant fading into the background. In one sense, becoming a non-body. I had this equation in my head that a quiet person equaled a humble person, and a loud person equaled an arrogant person. You can see why I didn't get on with humility very well. But that's not the definition of it. Humility, one of the best definitions of humility I've come across is by John Alridge, the theologian. And he says this, Shame says I am nothing to look at. I'm not capable of goodness. Humility says I bear a glory for sure, but it's a reflected glory of grace given to me. Humility doesn't stop us from rising up, embracing our gifts and going for it. It doesn't stop us from being bold or brave or humorous or adventurous or passionate, strong, loud or confident. One of the most amazing characters in the scriptures is King David. I believe he exuberated incredible humility. And yet there are parts of scripture where he seems to be the life and soul of the party as well. Gwyneth read for us earlier the story of the account of David and Goliath. For years and years, the 
this account has been told with great relish. Here we have the Philistines on one hill and the Israelite army on the other. They're faced in battle. Every day their warrior Goliath, nine feet tall, walks out into the middle ground and he hurls insights at them. He mocks the Israelite army. He lays down the challenge. Send out one of your fighting men to battle with me. If we, the Philistines, beat you, then you, the Israelites, become subject to us. But if your man defeats me, Goliath, then the Philistines will be subject for you. Throughout the whole of the army of Israelites, trained, fearsome warriors, not one of them is willing to take on the challenge. They are all terrified. And then there's this young shepherd boy. And he hears what Goliath says, and he is furious. How dare, how dare this Philistine put such shout curses on us? How can this, this Philistine defy the God, the army of the living God? And in front of everybody, he declares, let no one lose heart of account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. I can imagine that there were ripples of laughter at this point amongst the Israel army. These great warriors, trained fearsome warriors, and then this little child thinks he can take on Goliath. But we know the story. David persuades King Saul to let him go. He grabs, he grabs his sling and five stones. He walks out into the battlefield, one crack at the sling, the stone flies right into Goliath's forehead and he is killed. The Israelites have found their most unlikely of heroes. And there's an amazing truth in this story. If we read through it, at no point before stepping out to fight does David reveal his name. He keeps saying, my servant, verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart foul because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. It is only after David has finally become victorious, standing over Goliath's body, that Saul turns to the commander of the army and he says, Abner, whose son is this man? And Abner replies, surely, O king, as I live, I haven't got a clue. I don't know who he is at all. How amazing is that? David has achieved the unthinkable and nobody knows who he is. Now I've got to be honest, if I was in David's shoes, I would have definitely played the martyr card. Said this is my name, my name's Hayley Young, I'm going to go out and fight Goliath, probably not going to win, but you know what, just for my bravery, you might want to make a statue, get my left side, it's my better side. Don't forget to include all my muscles. Because there's something within me they will want glory for myself. But David was different. David's only concern was that one name was glorified and it wasn't his. And that provokes the question for us this morning. Whose name are we living for? Are we living to make much of ourselves or are we living to make much of God? Humility is about having a healthy perspective of who we are in the light of who God is. It's not about denying our talents or shying away from them. It's about embracing them, thanking God for them, acknowledging that they're gifts from him. So what can we do to cultivate humility in our lives? How do we humble ourselves with a right perspective? Well, first of all, we need to connect. We need to connect with God. You see, humility starts with us seeing who God really is. Gathering before this great King, the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the Awesome and the Holy. It was Saint Augustine who wrote about the moment when he first, the first time he saw closely the mystery of God. He said this, he said, I trembled for love and terror. The thought of God made him at once shiver and burn with desire. To cultivate humility, we need to grow in our understanding of God. To enlarge our thinking of the vastness 
of God. No limitation, no imperfection in our creation should be projected onto God the Creator. Compared to Almighty God, we are but a breath, and we need to learn to embrace our smallness, because it's in that that we get a right perspective of God. We need to connect to God. Secondly, we need to contribute. One of the most incredible ways to cultivate a humble heart is to choose to serve behind the scenes, where no one's looking, contributing when no one's there, saying, you're amazing, you're doing a great job. Chris Tomlin, one of the popular worship leaders who wrote the song, How Great Is Our God, tells the story about him being called to be a worship leader. He was very young, he felt God say, you're going to be a worship leader. So he went to his pastor, he went to his minister, and he said, God's told me I'm going to be a worship leader. And his minister looked at him and said, that's great, but I haven't got a position for a worship leader. I've only got a position for a cleaner. Chris Tomlin thought, well, I'm not doing that. Went away, came back a couple of weeks later, said to his pastor, I really feel, I really feel that God's called me to be a worship leader. And the pastor said, well, that's great, but I haven't got a position for a worship leader. I've only got a position for a cleaner. <coughs> And so he said, well, he took it on. He took on the job for cleaning. He thought, I'll clean for a couple of weeks and then I'll get to lead worship. He said he was cleaning carpets, he was cleaning toilets, he was stacking chairs, locking up late at night for weeks. Those weeks then turned into months. And he, he started to get more and more furious. He started to get more and more bitter. He was going, God, you've called me to be a worship leader. Why on earth am I being the cleaner? And he said there was a moment when he was cleaning the toilets and suddenly God spoke to him. God spoke to him and said, what you're doing now is worship. And it was in that place that he learned what worship truly was. What about humility, about serving, about contributing. And after a while, the pastor noticed a difference in him. Noticed that his character had changed, his attitude had changed. And said to him eventually, why don't you get involved with the worship team? And now he says that he travels around the world singing the songs that God's gifted him with. And he says, God never lets me forget that moment cleaning the toilet. See, God's not looking for stars. He's looking for servants. And so the challenge is, in what ways are you and I serving? In what ways are we contributing behind the scenes? Investing in obscurity, in acts of service that bless others, that cultivate humility in us. So we need to connect to God. We need to contribute. And we also need to care. We need to care for each other. We need to love each other. We need to encourage each other. Now, jealousy is a really ugly trait. And it's horrible to see people consumed by jealousy and bitterness. You know, we get upset when the other person got that promotion, got that bonus, gets to do stuff up the front. We feel that their gift is better than ours. And if we're not careful, jealousy can enter in even in the church. What we need to do is we need to prefer each other. We need to cheer each other on. There were two theologians, well there were lots of theologians in the 18th century, but two in particular, George Whitfield and John Wesley. And they're well documented to have had some, a few disagreements on theological matters. And someone once bravely asked George Whitfield, will we see John Wesley in heaven? And George Whitfield replied, I fear not. Everyone was shocked. Surely he was not saying that their theological differences were so great that John Wesley wouldn't get into heaven. He carried on. He said, I fear not. John Wesley will be so near the so near the throne and me at such a distance, I will hardly get a sight of him. We can have disagreements with each other, but we can still cheer each other on. And it's that kind of attitude that we need to develop within us. There is no limit to how far a person can go as long as they don't care who gets the credit. 
God wants to bring us to a state of mind where we can design the best cathedral in the world and know that it's the best and rejoice that it in the best and, ever, and be even more glad if it was done by ourselves or with someone else. God wants us to be free of any bias of our own favour so that we can rejoice in the talents of others. We need to be people that care. Care for each other, prefer each other, bless each other, cheer each other on. And when we do that, we will see God's kingdom advancing. So in order to cultivate humility, we need to connect, contribute and care. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the account of David. Father, we thank you that through his life we see that he connected with you. He contributed to bringing your kingdom here on earth and serving your people. And he cared about your name and about others. Father, we're also reminded that David made mistakes. And we thank you that despite of those mistakes, he is still able to teach us so much about key discipleship matters. And Father, we pray that you, your Holy Spirit challenges us this morning about where our heart is. Father, we ask for forgiveness for times when we've lived for our, our own glory and not yours. And Lord God, we pray that your Holy Spirit illuminates Jesus over our lives. <coughs> that your Holy Spirit will help us to connect with you as God the Creator, as God the Almighty. That your Holy Spirit will help us to contribute, to serve, without bitterness or jealousy, but with love. And we pray that your Holy Spirit helps us to cheer each other on, despite of our differences. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name.